Hi, I'm Mori from Grey Narana Alliance, and this is a short video about windrow burning. Windrow burning is an alternate technique commonly used in WA to help them manage their resistant weeds in winter crops. These weeds are generally resistant to a wide range of in-crop herbicides. Windrow burning is where simple modifications are made to the back of the header. These modifications aim to deposit the straw and chaff fraction into a distinct windrow that will be later burnt. It is the heat of this fire that can kill and sterilise the seed. This chaff and straw fraction is estimated to contain a large portion of the weed seeds that are present at harvest. By killing these weed seeds, this prevents them from entering the weed seed bank. This will reduce the weed burden in the following crop. By reducing the population in crop, this will reduce the pressure on your herbicides and the selection pressure for resistance. As with any operation, there's always risks and downsides. Many of these risks and downsides have been experienced by Western Australian growers, but it's wondered if these risks and others may limit the suitability of windrow burning in the eastern states. Some of the key concerns is the risk of the fire getting away and burning the whole paddock, particularly in high yielding situations. Another is what happens if we get a lot of summer rain? Will we still be able to burn these windrows effectively? And another key concern is with our heavier soils, if they are wet, will they draw too much heat away from the fire and not kill the weed seeds? Let's try and address some of these issues now. Loss of ground cover is probably one of the greatest concerns. This loss of ground cover primarily is where the fire gets away and burns the whole paddock. Most growers find it hard to understand how you could actually burn a wheat crop that yielded three to four tonne per hectare without the fire getting away. A key point to remember though is that you don't actually harvest that crop as you would normally for a three to four tonne wheat crop. You actually have to harvest much lower to actually get underneath the ryegrass and the weed seed heads anyway. So you harvest that crop and leave a stubble that is more representative of a crop that may only yield one tonne per hectare. A very experienced grower from WA, Robin Cena, actually suggested you should harvest no higher than your row spacing. In doing so, that will prevent bridging when the fire is burning. Bridging is where the fire can jump between rows of stubble. The burning of windrows often doesn't see the intensity of the fire reach what you would often see in a traditional stubble burn. You can see in the video on the left that the fire is burning with a lot more intensity. In this situation, a longer length of row was actually lit all at one time. The fire has developed a lot more intensity and you can already see it's, the fire is burning outside that discrete windrow. In contrast, the one on the right is where the fire is burning in a traditional manner of burning windrows. The fire is lit in one spot and the fire simply walks along that row. In this situation here, the fire, although it's achieving the heat, as you can see in the glowing red stubble, it's not got that wild nature to it wanting to burn outside the row. Our second concern is with wet windrows in our summer rainfall environment. As you can see here, the soil is quite wet under the windrow. This particular paddock received nearly four inches of rain in the month prior to burning these windrows and another 10 mils only 10 days before. But the technique was still successful. Which brings us to our third concern, which is do wet heavy soils draw too much heat away from the fire so as not to kill those seeds. The heat of the fire dried any residual moisture left in the fuel. As you can see from the video, the stubble and the chaff fraction is actually quite dry, despite quite significant rainfall preceding it. And certainly the heat of the fire may have dried any residual moisture from the rows. But achieving a good hot burn is critical to the success of windrow burning. This is an image of a windrow that was not burned in ideal conditions. That critical temperature was not achieved. In this situation, the windrow was not burnt when the rest of the paddock was, but burnt later in much cooler and milder conditions, and it subsequently didn't kill the ryegrass seed, and that is left in this windrow as can be seen in this canola crop. But just look at how much ryegrass seed is in this windrow. Imagine if we could take that out of the seed bank and out of next year's crop. In this next image, in the foreground, the windrow was not burnt, but in the distance, it was burnt. You can see the, the level of ryegrass in the foreground. In the lower part of this next image, the windrow was not burnt on time. In the distance, though, it was burnt on time. And you can see the contrast in the level of ryegrass. 
So this hopefully demonstrated that in this circumstance, the temperature achieved in the fire was a lot more critical than the rainfall that the site received prior to burning. So in summary, there certainly are risks to windrow burning, but in my opinion I think it's a viable option for northern New South Wales. The risks of fire escape are real, but I think they're mitigated by cutting stubble shorter and also by choosing suitable conditions to burn your windrows. Even the rain in the circumstance that we detailed in this presentation failed to lessen the results, but cool conditions and delayed burning in the rows that we actually missed certainly did. Windrow burning is going to be a cheap and effective option for us to manage some of our weeds in our winter crop and very valuable for managing herbicide resistance.